Asian economy recorded a seventh consecutive quarterly growth in the second quarter of 2022, as real GDP expanded by 3.54% year-on-year, an improvement compared to the 3.11% growth recorded in the previous quarter. Although lower than the 5.01% growth printed in the corresponding period of 2021. In terms of aggregate real GDP, it stood at 17.29 trillion naira, representing a quarter on quarter decline when compared to 17.35 trillion naira recorded in the first quarter of this year. A review of the second quarter GDP performance is our discussion for today. Welcome to Business Insight and Plus TV Africa. I am Justin. Akadonye. Now, first off, maximizing sales and operations are key requirements if young people want to upskill their businesses and move it to the next level. Now, this advice was given at the Ilfogens Masterclass, which was tagged Scale Up Your Business, organized for young people. Take a look. It is often tough for anyone to start out as an entrepreneur, building a new business from the ground up. Being young at the same time brings a unique set of challenges to the table. At this masterclass, these young people gather to upgrade their skill set in marketing, sales and operations management as required for the next level. If you want to grow your business in terms of how to sell, because you can be an entrepreneur, doesn't mean you have the capacity or the knowledge to sell. Uh, and what's the marketing requirement? What's the operations requirement? For a country like Nigeria, where disposable income is hard to get and earning capacity is reducing, there is a required capacity for salespeople. The facilitators also speak volume of challenges of instability in operations and how they can be surmounted. But um, there are proven skills and proven methodologies where you can bring more value to your customers that your customers are willing and able to pay more. So those are some of the things we are hoping to share today that we are practicing even in our own businesses. And within, in spite of the slump in economic situations, we are seeing growth in revenue. So we are hoping that we can share some more ideas because the truth is this, you must spend yourself out of recession. COVID world of business had changed completely both globally and locally in nigeria you know the issue of working from home you now have employees that never had an, a problem coming to the office five days a week saying they need to start working from home for more days then the changes in the economy the impact of the fx the impact of the ukraine war and all these activities that had direct impact on Costs generally have had infl inflation rates going out of the roof. Some entrepreneurs give insight on how to explore homegrown solutions for the country and indeed the continent. This is just as they implore Nigerians to make the most of opportunities which can make the country a hub. Regardless of the fact that we're Africans and we're promoting African tech talents, we try to ensure that they, are, they meet global standards and even the internal products and services that we build, we ensure that they meet global standards to change that narrative. So I think a fundamental challenge would be um, the, the level of tech adoption um, in this part of the world. I think um, the, the there's a rapid you know rate of tech adoption presently especially in this day and age um, but there's still like a huge gap you know especially when you factor in you know the literacy rates and whatnot i think there's a lot for us to do to make sure that we are pushing our own style our own fashion and braids is one of it braids has a lot of histories for example the bantu knot the bantu knot is and it's one of these slave trade styles for back in the days, and it was a wave sometime last year. We need that, uh, that entrepreneurial ability to be able to mass produce product that we can now export, but we need to be able to meet global standard for us to be able to export it. For cost management, young entrepreneurs are advised to be innovative, as there is always something to improve on and ways to add more value to clients. Welcome back. Those were useful insights for young people who want to upskill their businesses.
Now, moving on, road transport, coal mining are Nigeria's fastest growing sectors in the second quarter of this year. Joining us now to give a review of the second quarter GDP performance is a research and development economist, Gospel Obele. He is also the CEO of Streetnomics Limited. Thanks for joining us, Gospel, on the show. Thank you, Jay, for having me. It is indeed a pleasure. Let's just get straight to it now. The economy recorded a seventh consecutive quarterly growth in the second quarter of this year, as real GDP expanded by 3.54% year on year, an improvement compared to 3.11 growth recorded in the previous quarter. What does this translate to, really? Uh, well, I um, mean, in, in um, economic terms or literal terms, it just simply means that the economy, economic activities, you know, has improved, you know, by 3.5%, um, which is an increase from the previous quarter, Q1. Um, on the, from, from, from the top of mind, that sounds like a very positive um, um, thing to have. Uh, but, but, you know, it also um, should tells us that there's a difference between economic growth and, you know, the quality of life of the average um, person as it were. So economic growth may not necessarily necessitate that the quality of lives have improved. Economic growth only tells us that economic activities are on the rise. But you can have increased economic activities and still have poverty. You can have increased economic activities and still have uh, poor infrastructure, you know, worsening quality of life, worsening standard of living. So uh, they, they don't really, really go in the same direction in the context. So it's important for me to state that uh, because uh, um, um, conversations are out there, you know, asking Nigerians if they feel the GDP growth. Nigerians can't feel GDP growth. Um, they can only interpret the means of livelihood in terms of the quality or standard of living. Uh, but GDP growth in itself talks about economic activities, which can be positive, increasingly positive, uh, but yet you may also have a worsening standard of living at the same time. So put differently, now what you're saying is that economic activities might have actually uh, improved, but would you say that standard of living for Nigerians uh, has changed in any way recently, judging by what we have right now? Oh yeah, that that's definitely a no because I mean reasons why I also had to set the 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 table or the tone clear, you know, from the start. It's a capital no. I, I mean, we all know that uh, the price of tomatoes has increased in the market. Um, inflation is on the rise. You have a worsening interest um, exchange rate situation. Um, insecurity is also on the rise. So, um, comprehensively, you know, Nigeria is in a worse state than it, than, than, it, than it was last month, last quarter, as it were. But it doesn't necessarily mean that GDP um, activities would also worsen. GDP activities may increase, but the cost of doing business has also increased. So, it makes um, such that uh, Nigerians cannot feel the impact of, an, of improved economic activity. Also to say that economic activity does not necessarily mean economic productivity. You know, uh, when one look at the quality of life of the average Nigerian, we begin to look at it from a productivity standpoint. All right. Uh, now, the CBN raised interest rates twice in two months in a bid to combat the rising cost of goods and services. However, inflation rate, like you said, in, is still high. In the month of July, it rose to 17-year um, uh, uh, high of 19.64%. But what sense does this really make? Uh, we are recording growth. Uh, uh, CBN is uh, trying to adjust the economy, yet Nigerians go to the market and they are still growing. Does it really mean that this rates and this review by the CBN are not really working at all? I mean, so, I mean, conventional economics, I mean, basic conventional economics says that um, interest rates are a powerful tool, you know, to consider when seeking to curb inflation. Um, but then again, that, that, that assumption or that definition was built on, on the, on the assumption that the, in, the inflation you're battling with is a monetary phenomenon. So you can have inflation that is driven um, slightly by increase in money supply. That is a you know, monetary phenomenon. So the idea of interest rates is to discourage money supply so that you don't have a lot of, uh, in quote and unquote, a lot of money chasing fuel goods. But the context of the inflation we're dealing with right now globally, as well as in Nigeria, is no longer you know, of a monetary nature. You know, it's now more structural. It's now more geopolitically informed. It's now more, you know, leakage driven. It's now more cost push than monetary. So um, uh, in my own opinion, I think central banks, not just in Nigeria globally, are still using a conventional um, instrument to fight an unconventional war. 
you know that's why you can you see that inflation numbers are worsening even though um interest rates are increasing and you know central bank um, officials keep going through that cycle of seeking to increase interest rates more you know the, the only way out of it is to begin to look for more creative ways to bring down inflationary numbers that are not driven from non from, from non um, from monetary uh, uh economics as it were so Top of mind is to let us know that I do not think that interest rate is the best, you know, or most effective tool. It may be an important tool, but you need, it looks as though we need a complementary, um, a pool of tools, you know, to, to curb inflation um, right now in the economy. Anything outside that will keep hurting the economy. And let's not forget, a rise in interest rate also increases the cost of borrowing uh, for the real sector. Well, let's just uh, take it um, uh, step by step now and look at some of those um, uh, sectors uh, that actually grew. For instance, uh, let's start with um, the road transport sector. The sector recorded the highest growth rate in the Nigerian economy the second quarter with a 56.38% growth rate following a 24.63% contraction recorded in the previous quarter. My question right now would be, what did we really do differently? Because uh, one would have thought that uh, maybe there are some improvement, but Nigerians are still wallowing in transportation costs and all of that. Uh, so what does this uh, percentage growth really mean? Yeah, the percentage growth simply means that there's been an improvement in economic activities in that space. Now, it may not necessarily mean there's been some form of improvement in economic productivity in that sector. I mean, take for instance, has Nigeria exported more valuable use of coal to the global community? The answer is a big no. But our GDP says that our economic activities in the coal sector has improved. It may just mean, mean that you have more pressure on economic activities that has you know triggered or some form of concentration of investments or some sort that has triggered economic activities in that sector but it doesn't necessarily tell you that the, the country has taken that sector as a leapfrog towards growth or development or towards uh, prosperity or towards unlocking um, um, raw materials usage for value processing. It doesn't say anything of such. Um, on, on terms of road use, it may, it may just have been that the context um, is that you have more road users, you know, there have been more um, road related or infrastructure related activities. And technically, if you look at it, you know, a lot of state governors are engaging in a lot of um, 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 state related, you know, infrastructure activities, especially road projects. So, uh, but it doesn't necessarily tell you that Nigeria is much more prosperous, you know, for this particular economic activity, which is why, you know, I also go back to what I started by saying that economic activity in a particular sector does not necessarily mean that the country is moving towards the trajectory of economic prosperity or you know unlocking the potential of that sector you know to earn foreign exchange or to you know to boost economic growth and development in the real terms so that's what we're dealing with here yeah all right, I'm glad you actually mentioned um, coal mining, but uh, let me leave that for one minute and talk about air transportation, which uh, uh, apparently grew by 22.45%. I don't know, uh, uh, the past few months, there's been some you know, turbulence per se and um, crisis in the aviation sector. I'm really surprised that we actually recorded uh, lots of activities. How do you really react? Yeah, so um, the interesting thing about the GDP report is that the GDP report is a live report. So the lag report simply means that the activities of last quarter are being reported this quarter. Oh. So technically, the activities of this quarter will be reported in the next quarter. That's Q4. Okay. So that's to say that all of the events we've seen in the aviation sector recently will be captured if it will be captured, you know, that's a two different story now, uh -huh. will be captured in the next GDP report. So we expect to see the impact of, you know, recently, uh, this afternoon, I also, also read that Delta Airlines are also considering withdrawing from Lagos, New York um, um, route, as it were, you know, and that's a big impact uh -huh. for the sector. You know, and, and, and what that simply means in, in, in the Q3 report, which will come out in Q4, is expected that in, um, aviation numbers you know, should slow down because of these um, um, economics or variables that were seemingly out of control. And the central bank is trying to pump in some uh, billions of naira to rescue that sector in terms of all of the um, havoc and that, has, that it has caused you know, with the stakeholders. So we, the, the GDP is a large report. Uh, what we're looking at right now are events that happen in Q2.
okay. you know, and um, this is already Q3. So we may not be able to, it, so it doesn't also um, position us in a situation where we can see the true state of things. We can only understand better what happened in the previous sector. However, which also makes um, people who plan and businesses who plan and do a lot around GDP reports are actually reactive in the strategy because it means that you're planning with data that is one quarter behind. I didn't even get what I'm trying to say. It still do. doesn't yes, catch do. up. Yeah. All right. Uh, okay, fine. Uh, it is really very interesting now that you've actually uh, showed us or talked to us about the true picture. But let's uh, move forward. Quarrying and other minerals uh, you know, recorded about 22.15%. But my concern right now is the oil sector, which dipped by 11.77% year on year in the second quarter, compared to a contraction of 26.04% recorded in the first quarter of 2022. They did really surprise you what with, with what is playing out in the international market, uh, Russia, Ukraine crisis, and all of that. I'm, I'm not really surprised. Um... I'm not really surprised as well because um, there are many more forces right now, you know, militating against the growth of the oil sector. And, you know, um, one of the major events that's really shaped the world is the Russian-Ukraine war, not just in war, in, not, sorry, not just in, yeah, not just in war or conflict, but, or in oil, but also in, you know, commodities like grains, soya bean, you know, and sunflower and all those important um, ingredients that goes into, you know, home cooking um, ingred, uh, uh, products and all, all that. And that's where the global inflation also started from. So the impact, you know, is way more. And, and that's also what has been reflected in the inflationary numbers as well in Nigeria, that we've seen food inflation going as high as 22% and all of that. So I'm not surprised to say but it keeps it it, it it clearly shows to us as a nation, as a people, that our hope is now clearly in the non oil sector. Even in the revenue numbers, all right, the, the non oil sector, you know, in tax revenue made double oh. of what the oil sector made in Q1 2022. You know, and uh, lots of efforts were, 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 were a lot more hinged around oil sector. And, but oil sector performed literally about 300 and something billion um, compared to non oil that was almost six to 700 billion. So, without much effort, without much intentionality, the, the non oil sector has you know, grown in terms of impact. Yeah. and contribution. And yes, yes. It just uh, means that we need to focus our efforts better. Yeah, I was going to say that because uh, specifically in real terms, about 4.77%, that's what the oil sector, you know, grew, you know, uh, to or by. But uh, specifically in uh, real terms, uh, uh, ICT, trade, uh, finance, uh, and of course, agriculture, you know, spiked up that particular sector. But I want to uh, uh, stay on fintech. How do you see the pace of the fintech uh, moving forward uh, in the third quarter, fourth quarter? What do we expect to see? So um, to, to a very large extent, the, the, the fintech industry is a sector I've watched you know, for a while now. And I realize that there are diverging views around fintech, depending on which lens you're wearing. Mm. If you're wearing a core fintech hat, you know, there is this, this is the next big thing, that's the next big thing. And if, if you're wearing a hat of an economist like myself, and you've looked at the numbers closely, you will understand that what is really powering the fintech growth is the blend of two sectors, the financial sector and the ICT sector. And if you look at also the pandemic, those are two major sectors that were not really, really hit, you know, and they grew consistently because online payments, online transactions also grew, digital transactions also grew. So you have finance, people need to spend, you know, people need to pay, people need to save money and all that. Then you have ICT, people are doing on the mobile phones or through the mobile networks and all that. So by the time you blend that, that's why it's called FinTech, financial technology. However, the context of fintech as an industry a startup is still very very infant in its nature yeah. so there are still regulatory issues there are still data theft issues there are still licensing issues there are still what's the potential of the sector to scale so yeah a few sectors may be raising a few um, fintechs will be raising money here and there but the sector still needs a lot of governance and substance for its impacts to come alive yeah. you know and it, it also needs to evolve beyond the proposition of savings and just um, expenses or pocket money and all that you know so th th there's still a lot of substance value that is that's lacking in the sector you know however the sector is very promising due to the strategic blend of the digital economy 
and the financial payments economy. All right, thank you so much, John Gospel. But very quickly now, before we go, you talked about your concerns uh, about the interest rate and, and, of course, the CBN policies and everything. But uh, what would you really advise right now, on the last note, uh, uh, moving ahead for into uh, late uh, Q3 and, of course, uh, uh, the fourth quarter of the end of the year? I think I'll look forward to um, Nigeria trying to tap into every low-hanging low fruit she has, you know. And one, one major thing right there will be organizing the non-oil sector space for exports, no matter how little. A lot of SMEs are already exporting with or without government. So how can we organize it and make it more simpler for them to export and compete? By the time you do that, you have an edge in the foreign exchange, you know, which sort of balances out the demand side, demand and supply side pressure, you know, that sort of informing the cost push inflation we find right now. At some point, it was a demand pull inflation, but right now, it switched to a cost push inflation. Push, yeah. So you need, we need had an FX edge to be able to combat that, that's number one. Number two, that plus some other complementary tools, including interest rates, will help to curb inflation. But interest rate as a stand alone, I feel will do more harm than good. Thank you so much, Gospel, for your time. We do appreciate all the insight you. that you have brought. All right, and that's the size of the show. We must say a very big thank you to Gospel, uh, Obele, and economists who actually broke down all that we needed to know about the Q2 report of uh, the GDP. And that's the size of the show for today. I am Justin. I'll see you again next time. Bye for now.